So I want to thank Tim Walkman again of Plantscapes of New England for joining us today. Um, for those of you that missed it last week, Tim is a biologist by training and profession with over 25 years experience as a research scientist and with certification in secondary science education. He's a lifelong gardener and a plant enthusiast, and he honed his skills in plant selection, design, pest and, de and disease control, and ecological gardening approaches as a manager for many years in the region's largest garden center. He continually expands his knowledge through research, attending science-based landscape and gardening conferences, and exploring botanic gardens and natural habitats in New England and throughout the country. His areas of special interest and expertise are ecological restoration and landscape design with native plants and indoor gardening with tropical plants, especially orchids. Tim also has an active event schedule pro promoting ecological landscaping practices and environmental engagement to local residents. He's an active member and supporter of the Society for Ecological Restoration, the Native Plant Trust, the Berkshire Botanical Garden, the Arnold Arboretum in Boston, and the Fairchild Tropical Botanical Garden in Miami. So with that, I'm going to turn things over to Tim. Thank you. All right, thanks um, again to Cassie and for hosting tonight and to Westerly Library for um, sponsoring tonight's event. And welcome to everyone. Uh, this is Planting for Native Pollinators. This is one of my favorite talks. Um, I, I love sharing this information with people. It's, it's very popular. And um, there's a lot that we can do as individuals to, to contribute with pollinator gardens. So let me start before I get into my presentation by going to the Plantscapes website. And I'll show you a few, few things of, of interest there. Um, so the, the website's located at plantscapesne.com. And the first thing I'll point out is under Plantscape Events. Um, if you missed the first talk, Why Native Plants, um, I have a link here to the recording. And, and I've, I've got some, I've got some um, other talks coming up soon. Um, the third one in this series will be Enjoying Your Native Landscape, which will um, give you a lot of ideas of what to do once you've started putting native plants in your, your environment, uh, what you can do to get the most out of them, the most enjoyment from them. And then I'm very excited about a uh, talk that I'll be doing with Ledger Library in um, June, which is called Becoming an iNaturalist in Homegrown National Park. And this is a way of, it's a, a concept that I'm developing it, um, that uses um, pollinator pathways to expand um, native habitats and uses a, a really powerful citizen science app called iNaturalist to create a community to do so. So if uh, you're interested in pollinator gardening, that will, would be a, a talk on really how to take it to the next level. And then at the bottom of the homepage, there's, there's a number of links that I'll, I'll talk about. There's a menu bar. Um, for the purposes of tonight's talk, if you click on notes, It'll take you to a list of presentations. And tonight's presentation, Planting for Native Pollinators, if you click on the notes link, it will take you to my speaker notes. So everything that I talk about tonight is going to be in the notes. So any um, plants or books or websites that I mentioned should be all listed here. So you don't have to try and um, keep up with taking any notes tonight if you don't want to. So supporting biodiversity is for our own well-being, but it's also a responsibility that we have to future generations. And the fact is that biodiversity is in trouble right now. And just one um, data point that I'll, I'll put out there on this, we've lost over 45% of our insect abundance in just the last 50 years. 
and we continue to lose more and more insects, um, one or 2% every year. So this is a, a very serious problem, but the, the silver lining is that it's something that most, that all of us can actually do something about. And the biggest way we can help pollinators and other insects is to plant um, native plants in our, our landscape that will support their life cycle. Okay, so in the, in the last talk, I, I described the difference between a traditional landscape and a more ecologically responsible landscape. And there's several advantages to moving to a more ecological approach. Um, there's fewer in, inputs required. So a lot less you know, water and fertilizer and fossil fuels for mowing. Um, all those things we can pretty much put to the side when we're talking about native landscapes. There's also much less work involved because there'll be a lot less weeding and replanting. Um, and there's um, importantly, a lot of, a lot more um, things to look at and become interested in, in a native landscape. The traditional <clears throat> landscape is, is from a, insects or a, a bird standpoint, it's a very sterile environment and there isn't much there to attract them. Whereas if you start planting native plants, you'll be amazed at the, the things that start suddenly start showing up in your, around your home. And this is something that everyone has a role in, in or a way for everyone to make a contribution to a sustainable and thriving planet. And I, I can't think of very many things that are more important than that. <clears throat> so another motivation for supporting pollinators is that they provide a lot of benefits to us. And something that we often take for granted is the food production. But if you go to your supermarket and look in the produce section, most of the items that are available in that produce section required pollinators to, to help produce those fruits and vegetables. So we're very dependent on, on pollinators for our, our food security. Also, um, sustaining biodiversity is critical to a thriving planet. The insects and native plants have co-evolved, so they're dependent on each other. The insects require the native plants for their, their pollen and nectar and leaves to chew on, and the native plants require pollinators in order to set seed and distribute those seeds um, and propagate them um, for the plant's future generations. And humans are, are also dependent on, on those um, interactions between pollinators and, and their plants, because as I said, our, our food sources are dependent on pollinators. And finally, ecological landscapes have a lot of aesthetic value to them as well. Um, there's a, a huge variety of native plants out there. They're exquisitely adapted to our local environment, so they do very well here. And um, they really provide a lot of things to engage us and, and um, stoke our interest. Okay, so what can we do to, to, to support pollinators so that they can continue to support us? Um, there's three big factors right now that are impinging on the success of pollinators. The overriding problem is habitat destruction. And that comes in a variety of forms, um, sprawling development, um, conversion of wild places to agricultural production, often to supply um, 
a growing demand for meat and um, also the encroachment of invas invasive species, which tends to crowd out um, native species and, and keeps them from, from thriving. The, the second big area of concern is the, the use of pesticides. And I'll, I'll talk about this much uh, in, a little, in a little bit more detail later, but um, the, the bottom line here is that we really don't need to use the, the amount of pesticides that we're pouring into the environment. And they're having a very detrimental effect on, on insects and birds. And finally, climate change is making it very difficult for very challenging for living things to adapt um, more rapidly than they're capable of. So anything we can do to, to slow down climate change um, and is something that you know, we should all be thinking about. Um, and if we continue with business as usual, we're gonna run into a, a lot of problems. The food insecurity that I mentioned, we're going to start losing a lot of plants and insects. And when we start losing plants and insects, we're gonna start losing lots of birds. And ultimately this becomes a, a threat to humanity as well. So we're in a, a very critical time right now and we all need to be aware of the effects that we're having on the environment and things that we can do to support biodiversity. Okay, so what can we do to help out our pollinators and enrich our own lives in the process? Um, one book that I would recommend that you all make part of your library is um, Pollinators of Native Plants by Heather Holm. And this is a, a great resource for anyone who wants to dive deeper into pollinator gardening, because it's, it's not just a, a field guide for pollinators. It describes in, in great detail their life cycles, their, their nesting requirements, um, their behaviors, especially how they interact with native plants and other insects that are in the environment. But it also contains a lot of very practical information on how to design and select plants for a pollinator garden, um, how to maintain them. Um, it's just a, a wealth of, of information for anyone that's interested in pollinators. Um, so in the next few slides, I'm just going to give a very quick overview of the types of pollinators that you'll see when you plant a pollinator garden, because many of these insects are, are not going to be present in a traditional landscape because there's nothing there for, for them to utilize in terms of resources or habitat. So bees are a, a, um, a big, big group within the pollinators and they can be divided into solitary bees and social bees. Um, solitary bees are things like this uh, cellophane bee, which is a, a ground nesting bee. Um, and the solitary bees, they, they nest in, in the ground or in the cavities of stems or, or uh, cavities in, in plant material. And the females create a, a chamber in there where they lay their eggs and the um, females stock that chamber with food. And throughout the year, the the um, bee larvae will develop on those food stockpiles. And then when they've matured, they'll come out into the, into the environment. But there are a lot of these solitary bees that um, if you create the, 
the habitat for them, um, they'll become very, very active in your pollinator um, garden. And I'll, I'll talk in more detail about how to create habitat for these guys in a bit. And then there's the social bees like the bumblebees. Um, there are 16 different varieties of bumblebees, species of bumblebees in New England. Um, many of them are, are threatened or declining now, um, but these are one of the, the favorite things that I enjoy watching in, in my, my garden. Um, they just have wonderful behaviors to, to watch and um, they just provide endless entertainment. But there's many things that we can do to, to support them as well. Um, likewise, the wasps can be div uh, divided into solitary wasps and social wasps. Um, <clears throat> yellow jackets are, are one of the social wasps. They have a, a well-deserved um, and notorious reputation for being aggressive, but all that they're trying to do is defend their, their colony. And if we can find a way to coexist with them, they're actually a very important garden beneficial. So they will, they're predators on a lot of the things that we consider pests in the garden. And um, so if we can um, keep them around, they'll provide a lot of benefits to us. And if you grow goldenrod, for example, they'll be so interested in the the pollen and nectar in that goldenrod that they won't even pay any attention to you. And then there's a lot of solitary wasps out there. And many of these mimic the, the colors and patterns of yellow jackets because um, they've evolved this coloration so that, that birds and other predators on them will, will tend to leave them alone. But as long as you don't handle them roughly, these are, are perfectly docile and, and harmless wasps there. And many of them are also um, very good garden beneficials. Uh, the next group is beetles. And there's a, a huge diversity of beetles that will, will show up in pollinator gardens. Um, some of these are also beneficials that are predators on the things that we consider garden pests. Um, the beetles as a group will often feed on flowers and leaves um, as well as the, the pollen and nectar, but they, they do provide some pollination services as well. Um, as this wedge-shaped beetle here shows. He's been climbing around on the flowers, covered himself with pollen. And as he moves around, he's going to, to pollinate some of those flowers. The beetles are, are nowhere near as efficient as bees in pollination because they tend not to move around much from plant to plant, but they do, they do move a, a fair amount of pollen. One of the beetles that you might keep an eye out for, especially if you're um, planting goldenrod, is a blister beetle. And this is one that you don't want to try and handle because it does have um, the capability of giving off a, a chemical substance that will give you a nasty burn if you try and handle it. So just um, observe this guy from a distance and um, they won't give you any trouble. My favorite group of pollinators by far are the lepidopterans, so the butterflies and moths. And a, a wonderful reference book on butterflies is The Life Cycles of Butterflies by Judy Burris. This book is, is very appropriate for kids, but if I have a, a question or, need, or I need to make a a reference to almost anything butterfly. This is the first book that I go to. It is richly illustrated. It has um, the complete life cycle for about 30 different butterflies that are present in our area. 
and it has pictures of their eggs, all the larval instars, the chrysalis, and the different adult forms that are available. Um, it also talks about the favorite nectar plants for the various butterflies and also the host plants that the larvae um, need to feed on in order to develop as caterpillars. So there's, there's a whole lot of useful information in that book. And you can just pick and choose different butterflies that you want to try to invite into your landscape. It'll tell you what nectar plants to plant, what host plants are required. And I guarantee you, if you plant it, they'll, they'll come. Um, three of my favorite butterflies are depicted here. Um, this is a spice bush swallowtail. It's not uh, one of our largest butterflies, but I think it's one of the most beautifully colored ones out there. And I think this is absolutely the most adorable caterpillar that, that I've seen. And if you know what to look for in some of its behaviors, it will be endlessly entertaining as well. And spice bush is a, a plant that's very prevalent in our landscapes. And if you're driving along a, a forest right now, if you look off into the, the edge along a roadway, you're very likely to see the spice bush in, in bloom. The fem female plants have, are probably finishing up their bloom right now. And the male plants um, were um, at the peak of their bloom probably a couple weeks ago. But these are plants very easy to grow in our, in our local environment. If you plant spice bush on your property, you can go out periodically and look for the leaf curls where these caterpillars are hiding. They're, they're very um, easy to find on the spice, spice bush plant. Um, most of us are familiar with the, the um, monarch butterfly and the, the amazing migration that it makes every year. Um, the monarch population has been going through wild population swings the past few years. Part of that is weather related, but part of it is also, again, habitat destruction. Um, and what the monarchs need is, is milkweed. And they need a, a, an abundant, steady supply of milkweed all along the way as they're, they're migrating. Uh, north from Mexico. So if at all possible, if you can find any corner of your property where you could stick some milkweed, and there's many varieties that are suitable for almost any sort of situation, um, please try to put some milkweed um, into your gardens. And in, in very short order, I'm sure you'll see some, some monarch butterflies and their caterpillars around. Um, our largest butterfly in this area is the tiger swallowtail. I've seen some of these out um, already. They're one of the first butterflies to appear in spring. And one of their favorite host plants is the sweet bay magnolia, which is a, a native in this area. It's a absolutely wonderful flowering plant. It has um, um, four season interest and it's it's also um, a semi deciduous shrub so you can use it as a, a screening plant even but this is another plant that if you have um, the right conditions on your property I, I highly encourage planting um, the, the sweet bay and the final group of pollinators are the flies and this is also a very diverse group. Um, some of my favorite characters here are the, the bee flies. These tend to hover at, at flowers like a, a hummingbird would. So they're very, very entertaining to watch. Um, there are surfid flies, which again, these are, are perfectly harmless to us. They do mimic some of the um, aggressive wasp species though, but this is a very important garden beneficial. They will take care of a lot of the aphid problems that, that might crop up in, 
in a garden. And then there's the, the um, tachnid fly with their, their characteristic spiky bottoms. These are very important for um, controlling um, beetle and bug populations. So keeping some of those um, garden herbivores under control. And then there's this little guy, which is a canopid or thick-headed fly. And these are very tiny, but they have the, the remarkable ability to lay an egg on other um, insects in flight. And that egg will develop and um, kind of cannibalize that insect that they've, that they've applied the egg to. Um, so a lot of really fascinating things out there that can then can really um, give us a lot of things to, to learn about and become interested in. Okay, so it, in this section of the talk, I'm gonna focus on how to create habitat in your landscape that will support the entire life cycle of these pollinators. And as an example, um, to get us started on that, thinking on that, um, I'm gonna use the bumblebee. Um, right now in, in springtime, the, the new females are going to be out and actively foraging for, for pollen and nectar. And um, so they're gonna be looking for a lot of the um, spring ephemerals, but also the, the trees and shrubs that are starting to go into bloom right now. And as they build up their, their stores of energy with, with um, the nectar that they're collecting, the, the queens are gonna be looking for suitable habitat where they can start a new colony. So if they find a, an attractive landscape, they will look around for some sort of space under a log or a rock or perhaps a rodent tunnel. And <clears throat> that's where they'll, they'll look to create their nesting site. And the females in, in early summer will um, continue to collect um, nectar and pollen. And they'll use that to um, make bee bread, which they'll lay their eggs on to start their first brood. And as that brood um, develops and the, the worker females um, come into the, the hive, the queen bumblebee will stop foraging. Uh, the, the female workers will take over the foraging activities and the, the queen bumblebee will essentially just become an egg laying machine. And they typically have um, a couple broods during the summer. And in the last brood, um, the queen will start producing the uh, next generation of queens, which are called gynes, but also the, the males will, will start to be produced by the hive. And late in the summer, the, the gynes and the males will mate and then the new queens will start to look for an overwintering site. And what they typically <clears throat> nest in over the winter is leaf litter. So as I'll, I'll talk about in a bit, maintaining ample leaf litter in your environment is very important to create habitat for the, the bumblebees and a lot of other pollinators. One thing to do when you're designing a pollinator garden is to think about um, creating perpetual bloom for the, the insects that are out there. And this is a, a set of tables from Heather Holmes' website where she um, breaks out a, a list of, of native trees and shrubs on the left and native perennials on the right that are attractive to pollinators. And she shows throughout the um, season, spring, summer, and fall, which of these plants are going to be providing pollen and nectar sources for the pollinators. And what you can see here is that 
early in the season, in the springtime, there aren't a lot of plants that are able to support the pollinators. But so you want to make sure that you've got things like maples and pussy willows in the in the landscape that can support the the pollinators when there aren't a lot of other things in bloom. During the summertime, there are a lot of um, trees and shrubs and a lot of perennials that will bloom throughout the season. And you can pick and choose your favorites from, from a list like this. Uh, but just try and make sure you have something in bloom all the time so you can support those um, bee colonies as they're, as they're growing and as the, the uh, queen bumblebees are developing their broods throughout the summer. And then the other very important time of year to think about is the fall, because again, there are fewer flower species that are available to pollinators in the fall. So you wanna look for things like the um, asters and goldenrods that'll, that'll bloom for a, a long period into the, the fall and support the, the queen, the new queen bumblebees up until the point where they're they're searching for an overwintering site, which could happen, you know, as late as um, the end of October. So, what sort of things can we do in our in our backyards, keeping in mind the the life cycle of a bumblebee, for example? Um, if you have any um, dead tree snags in your, your yard, if you can safely keep those standing, they create a lot of very valuable and rare habitat um, in the landscape that um, birds and bees, butterflies will, will utilize these um, often for, for many years. If the logs have fallen and you can keep those in place, um, doing so will also provide a lot of valuable habitat, especially to um, beetle population, uh, for example. There's a um, mantra in gardening circles now that's becoming more and more popular, which says leave the leaves. And there's a lot of ecology that, that is behind that and supports that because the, <clears throat> the leaves that have fallen have an enormous amount of of um, lepidopteran eggs and larvae and chrysalis and even adults that are, are hiding in that leaf litter. And if we rake that up or we mulch it or bag it and take it off the property, it's destroying a lot of that, a lot of the, the uh, butterflies and moss that are in that leaf litter. And leaf litter is also the best mulch that you can, can have in your, your uh, flower beds and such. So there's really no, no reason to, to remove it. And as I said, it's also something that the um, new queen bumblebees are going to, to look for to overwinter in, in, the, in the fall. So it's very important to them. If you can find a place in your property to put uh, a brush pile. Um, it doesn't have to be very large, just a, you know, a 10 by 10 brush pile will provide a lot of habitat for a, a wide range of organisms, um, including um, butterflies and birds and, and bees as well. Uh, water sources are, are critical for all, all kinds of life. If you can put a, a bird bath or a, a bog or a frog pond into your yard, that will attract and support a lot of wildlife. Um, it's important though to either keep it very shallow or put some materials in the, the bird bath like rocks or things that the, the bees and butterflies can perch on and so they don't fall into the, the water and can't escape. Um, another really useful graphic that Heather Holm has on her website is how to create create habitat for stem nesting bees. And 
Here the idea is when we're thinking about fall cleanup, the, the best practice now is just not to do it. Leave the stems up uh, from your perennials, the seed heads on those will provide valuable food sources for, for birds throughout the, the winter. And they also provide a lot of winter interest, especially after a snowfall, if your, your cone flowers are capped with a little bit of snow, that, that's uh, actually a very pretty feature to have in the landscape. Um, and again, leave, just leave the leaves in the, in the flower beds. Um, they'll, they'll just create a good mulch for your plants. And then when, when spring comes, rather than clearing out the, the plant material, um, what you can do is just cut down those flower stems to a, a range between eight and 24 inches and um, just leave the stubble there. And the, just you can drop the debris right on top of the, the leaf litter and that will become incorporated into the garden over time. And when you open up those, those stems, it creates nesting sites for native bees. And the, the female bees will, will find those nesting sites and start laying um, food sources and, and eggs in those chambers. Um, during the summer, the, your perennials will, will grow up and all that stubble will be completely hidden, but the stubble will be filled with chambers of those um, native bee larvae that will continue to develop over, over the, the summer. In fall and winter, again, leave the, the plants up, the bees will overwinter in those stems, and then come springtime, they'll emerge and um, start the whole cycle over again. Um, some very important plants to include in your perennial beds uh, would be things like the, the bee balm and echinacea, um, the goldenrod as well. These all have hollow stems that are gonna be very attracted to the stem nesting bees. And a couple final points here. Um, bee hotels are becoming very popular now. And, you know, we put these up with the best of intentions. Um, but bigger is not always better. Actually, um, the larger bee hotels like this just tend to, to invite in bee predators and bee diseases, which are really not good for the um, really not good for the bees. Um, if you do want to use these, the recommendation is you know use a small block with maybe a half dozen holes of different sizes in them, and use a number of the, the blocks and spread them throughout the landscape so that the predators and diseases won't be able to, to find them as easily. Um, and also if you do, do buy these pre-made pre ones, um, you should, the best practice is just to dispose of them after a season or two um, so that they stay clean and, and don't present any problem for the, um, local bee population. Okay, and the final thing I'll talk about here is um, night lighting too. This is something that's very detrimental to insects, especially moths. Um, night lighting is very confusing to moths. It interferes with their, their mating behavior and it also um, makes them very subject to predation from bats and other things that are out there. So if you do need night lighting in your landscape, please put it on a timer or best of all, a, a motion activated sensor so that it only turns on um, <clears throat> when there's movement in the landscape. And from a security standpoint, if that's why you're putting up the lighting, the motion sensor is gonna be the, the most effective thing for that anyway. Okay, um, I said I would say a bit about pesticides. Um, so this is my take on, on bringing pesticides into the environment. Um, 
the bottom line is not to use them unless they're absolutely necessary, avoid it if at all possible. Um, if we're planting native plants and inviting in um, native pollinators, then we actually want the, the larvae to be chewing on the leaves. It's the way that energy from the sun gets transmitted through leaves and the, the caterpillars out to the, the bird population and through the rest of the ecosystem. So um, this is a very natural process of energy transfer that we don't wanna interfere with. Um, there are also a lot of beneficial predatory insects out there that will control the, the pest species if we just give them a chance. So things like um, ladybugs and the, the surfid flies and the, the tachnids are all very efficient at, at removing those, those garden pests. We just have to give them a chance, usually just a matter of a few days to find that the aphid population is, is blossoming. And they'll, they'll find it very quickly and, and start taking care of it for us. Often when we put pesticides out, you know, if we rush to, to spray something, we're just interfering with the, the natural process of the, the predatory insects taking care of the, the other ones that we don't want to be there. Um, if you do have to use some pesticides on your vegetable garden, for example, please pick the things that are the, the least toxic. Um, there's some things out there that are, are fairly specific and less hazardous to innocent bystanders, um, things like um, BT and spinosad and, and neem oil, for example. But again, um, less is better with all of these pesticides. Also apply them as late in the day as possible um, when the bees and a lot of the other pollinators have gone home for the day. Uh, the final thing I'll, I'll talk about is neonicotinoids. Um, these have been around for, for quite a while now, and we're learning that they're, they're very destru destructive to insect populations, bird populations, and there's growing concern that they're even um, a problem to higher mammals, including probably people. Um, and they're still very heavily used in agriculture, in the nursery industry, landscaping. Um, and one of the things you wanna watch out for when you're creating a pollinator garden, if you go to a nursery, um, make sure that the plants that you're selecting do not have these systemic pesticides in them. Because if you bring a plant that's loaded up with neonics back to your garden, you're just going to be killing a lot of the pollinators that you're, you're looking to attract in. Um, okay, so in this uh, last set of slides, I'm just going to talk about some different landscape situations and different types of native plants that you can think about um, including in those situations. Um, as I've said before, the wonderful thing about native plants is that they're evolved to fill every available niche that we can think about in, in New England. So for any situation, there's going to be multiple native plants um, that can, can be used in that situation. So this is a scenario that's um, very, very challenging often. Um, the hell strip between a, a sidewalk and curb in an urban or suburban situation. Um, it's hot and dry. And you also have to think about the, the people that are moving through, through, through this area. But there are many plants that are, are low profile um, that do very well in this, this challenging kind of environment. Um, things like um, little blue stem that can provide four season interest um, again, low profile. Um, 
the butterfly weeds and campanulas. Um, the prairie smoke has a, a very um, extended period of bloom and these wonderful seed heads at the, the end that provide a lot of interest. And then going later into the season, the golden rods and asters. And there are many varieties that are available that are, are um, shorter and would not be um, you know, intimidating to people that would be walking along a sidewalk situation like this. So a lot of different things you could possibly do with, in a curbside situation. If you have a shady area or a woodland walkway like this, um, there's many plants that you could introduce into this sort of landscape that would gradually um, get a foothold and then start to naturalize the area. Um, they all tend to seed, seed around and find places that are suitable for them to grow. Um, the native Carexes, like Carex pennsylvanica, this is a very shade tolerant um, species that would be good along a woodland pathway. It um, takes to mowing and a little bit of foot traffic too. So you could even use it as a, um, as a turf grass to, to um, cover a pathway like this. Um, one of my favorite um, woodland flowers are the, the columbines. Um, these are beautiful flowers that are very attracted to hummingbirds and a lot of the other pollinators. And they'll gradually seed around and you'll find them in all kinds of new places in a, in a woodland setting. Northern sea oats is, um, has a lot of really nice sensory effects. Um, it tends to move in the wind nicely, has very attractive seed heads, um, provides a lot of ecological benefits. And then there's all the, the spring ephemerals, um, again, goldenrods that do well in a, a shade situation and all the asters that are, are available as well, even ones that are very shade tolerant, like the, the wood asters and the, the Hartley faster shown here. And then finally, if there's, if you have a lot of space to work with, um, there's nothing better from an ecological standpoint than to put in a, a forest edge and um, meadow type landscape. This is supremely productive in terms of pollinators and all the other, um, supporting all the other wildlife that's out there. And if you have a large amount of space to work with, um, you know, you can put in a huge amount of diversity into a, a situation like this, but you don't necessarily need a lot of territory on a quarter acre lot or even less, you can put in a pocket forest and a mini meadow and some edge plants in there and provide the layered landscape and um, all the plants that are needed to support the, the birds and, and pollinators as well. The things you wanna keep in mind are to include the, the keystone species that I talked about in the last talk the, the types of plants that have an outsized role in supporting biodiversity, things like the white oaks and the, the red maples, things in the cherry family. If there's a, a moist environment, the pussy willows and bone set are very important. In the, the meadow area, um, you can have the, the little blue stem and the big blue stem, the monardas, asters, of course, and there's always places where we, we can find to put milkweeds of various types. Um, so there's a, a whole lot of things that you can do if you, you um, have a scenario like this. There are some special considerations in 
designing and installing and maintain, maintaining a meadow like this. So before you just dive in and, um, you know, just kind of let your landscape go, which doesn't, doesn't really work. It, it's good to do some research and educate yourself about how to, to really um, build this sort of ecosystem. And, um, or you can um, consult a, a person that's knowledgeable in, in putting a, a landscape like this together. Okay, and I will just end with um, this plug for the Native Plant Trust. Um, if you go to my uh, website, the homepage at the bottom in the menu bar, if you click on, on the visit link, it, it will take you to a, a list of places in the area that um, I encourage people to go to get inspiration about um, planting pollinator gardens and including native plants in their landscape. But um, my favorite place to go for inspiration um, is, is by far garden in, in the woods um, in Framingham, Mass, just outside of Boston. And this is the headquarters for the Native Plant Trust. They have a, a bookstore, garden shop, and nursery there, and acres and acres of, of landscape with all sorts of microenvironments, microclimates. And pretty much the only microenvironments they don't have there are either alpine or seashore. Um, otherwise, they've, they've managed to include little pockets of, of um, habitat for just an incredible number of different species. And they've also put a lot of thought and work into curating the environment to, to come up with really interesting plant combinations. So if you go there with a, a camera, you, you can collect a whole lot of ideas on, on things that you can put into your landscape. And most of the plants are labeled too, so you kind of know um, what you're, you're dealing with. You can make plant lists very easily, go back home and, and do some research on the things that you've, you've uh, seen there. And the, the people there are all plant nuts. They love native plants and they're, they're very um, happy to, to talk to you about uh, the plants that they've they've worked into the the garden in the woods there. Um, so I think we'll end with that. Um, thank you all for your attention and taking the time to to join me for this presentation tonight. And I'd be happy to take any questions. And we have another question in the chat. Um, somebody is wondering, how do you have a water source that doesn't encourage mosquitoes? Um, so the, the mosquito life cycle runs on a, a week to 10 day cycle. So if you're going out every, say twice a week to dump out that, that bird bath, you can interrupt the um, life cycle of the mosquitoes very, very easily. And that's good for the birds um, as well, putting in a fresh, fresh supply of water occasionally. Um, there are mosquito dunk materials you can put in as well that um, are very, very safe and easy to use. If it's a situation like a, a bog or frog pond that you can't empty out uh, very easily, you can use some mosquito dunks in there that will will take care of the mosquito population. And those, those products are, are perfectly safe for birds and, and people and kids and pets, any, anything else. All right. Yeah, thank you, Tim. Um, I'm gonna end the recording here. Um...